Hello, does this book set the stock market? How is everyone doing? As for me, I came back from my run, so I'm feeling pretty good. I can find a run wearing shorts, and it's not so dark out in the morning. My new camera finally arrived, so I was able to use it while running. I bought the DJI Action and a cheap chest mount from Amazon, so filming the run isn't so hard. I was trying to buy a GoPro, but those are too expensive. Maybe in the future, I'll upgrade to a GoPro. So far, the only problem... So far, the only problem... So far... So far, the only problem I have is my hands tend to show while running, so I'm guessing my chest mount is too low. I tried to lower my hands from their usual position, but it still shows, so I'm thinking I might need to order a different mount. With that out of the way, let's get into this week's video. In this week's video, we'll be returning to learning about technical analysis. This video will continue talking about the Elliott Wave Theory. Specifically, we'll learn about the Fibonacci Ratio and Retracements. I'll probably should have finished covering the Elliott Wave Theory before moving on to a different style of video so people don't forget what part 1 covered. However, I think it worked out in the end since the video that came after part 1 was showing off my 200% gains and yeah, those didn't exactly last. I think it dropped to somewhere around 140% after a couple of days, which is still good, but it wouldn't be as clickbaity as 200%. Before we get into Fibonacci ratios and retracements, let's go over some leftover material that did not make the cut in part 1. I'll first explain the rule of alternation. The rule of alternation states the market does not act the same way twice. This helps explain some corrective patterns since they have a tendency to alternate. For instance, if the corrective pattern was a simple ABC pattern, then wave 4 would be a complex pattern like a triangle. If you do not know what a simple ABC pattern or a complex corrective pattern is, then I highly suggest you look at part 1 before moving on. Let's now talk about channeling. I made a whole video about channeling, but in short, in an uptrend, draw a channel by drawing the lower trend line first. The lower trend line can be drawn by connecting the bottom lows. You then clone it and move it so it fits the tops. For instance, here's QQQ. The lower trend line was drawn by connecting the lows. It was then cloned and placed up here where we see where it connects to the top. However, as you can see, price breaks through the channel line. So what do we do now? To solve this problem, we would have to adjust the trend line. Because the broken channel line does not serve much use, to adjust the broken channel line, you would first draw the trend line in the direction of where the price is moving. For an uptrend, you would draw the upper trend line first and then clone it and move it towards the last low in the initial channel. Let's look at an example. Here we see price pattern and we broke through the initial blue channel. Since price breaks to the upside, we will first draw the upper trend line. We then clone it and move towards the last low in the initial channel. So why did I briefly review channeling? Well, channeling is very applicable to the Elliott Wave Theory. I'll first go over the steps and then provide a visual aid to help explain a lot of the information I'm about to spit out. The first step in drawing a channel on Elliott Waves is by drawing an uptrend line along the bottoms of Wave 1 and Wave 2. This channel usually holds until Wave 3 where we see an uptrend accelerate and break through the upper trend line. This means lines have to be redrawn. The line is redrawn by using wave 2 and wave 4. The end of wave 2 will be for the lower trend line while the start of wave 4 will be for the upper trend line. And finally, the fifth wave usually comes close to the top of the final channel before correcting. Here we see our generic Elliott wave. We first need to draw our initial trend line. This is done by finding the lows of wave 1 and wave 2. After that, we simply connect the dots. We would then copy this line, and use this point as our guide. After that, we paste this line on this orange point. We see that wave 3 broke through our initial channel, and wave 5 is pretty much above it as well. We will use these two points to draw the upper trend line of our second channel. Once we connect the dots, we get this. We will then copy this line. Finally, we use this point and the end of wave 2 as our guides for the lower trend line. After that, we just paste our trend line. Once this purple channel breaks, then we know for sure the correction phase of the Elliott Wave Theory has started. I have one more point to make about the Elliott Wave Theory. After the fifth wave is completed, we enter the correction phase and we should see the fourth wave act as an area of support. This means that wave C shouldn't be able to go lower than wave 4. Now that we covered the pattern portion of the Elliott Wave Theory, let's go over the two other components. These components will rely heavily on the Fibonacci numbers. These components will rely heavily on the Fibonacci numbers, so if you understand how Fibonacci numbers work, this section should be pretty straightforward. 
If not, I'll explain as I go, so hopefully you will have a better understanding of this concept. These are Fibonacci numbers, and I'll list some properties that make them so special. First, the sum of any two consecutive numbers equals the next highest number. Second, the ratio of any number and its next higher number approaches 0 0.618. For instance, 1 divided by 1 is 1, but as we go down the line towards, let's say, 8 and 13, we get 0 0.615, which is closer to 0 0.618 than 1. 13 divided by 21 is 0 0.619, which is closer to 0 0.618, and is further down than 8 and 13, which makes sense. This means that as we go further down the line, we get closer to the 0 0.618 number. Third, the ratio of any number and its lower number is approximately 1.618. Using the same logic again, we see 21 and the next lower number is 13. 21 divided by 13 is equal to 1.625. Once again, as we go further down the line, it gets closer to 1.618. For instance, 34 divided by 21 equals 1.619, which is closer to 1.618 than 1.625. Finally, the ratio of alternate numbers approach 2.618, while the inverse approaches 0.382. For example, 13 divided by 34 is 0.382, while 34 divided by 13 is 2.615. So why do I explain all these interesting behaviors of Fibonacci numbers? Well, the Elliott wave theory is based on Fibonacci numbers, and therefore we can use the same numeric patterns and apply them to the waves. We will be first going over impulse waves and then move our way towards corrective waves. Before we directly apply Fibonacci patterns to waves, there is an important characteristic when a wave is longer than expected. If one of the three waves are overextended, then the other two should be equal to each other. For instance, if wave 5 is longer than expected, then waves 1 and 3 should be equal. Likewise, if you say wave 3 is longer than usual, then waves 1 and 5 should be of similar length. Now, let's apply some Fibonacci patterns to the waves with this in mind. First, the minimum target for the top of wave 3 can be obtained by multiplying the length of wave 1 by 1.618. You then add this to the bottom of wave 2. This general concept can be applied to when waves 1 and 3 are equal, but wave 5 is longer than expected. When this happens, the price objective can be obtained by measuring the distance from the bottom of wave 1 and the top of wave 3. You then multiply the sum by 1.618 and add that to the bottom of wave 4. This will give you the max height of overextension for wave 5. Finally, when the impulse waves are expected to be of normal length, then wave 5 can be approximated by multiplying wave 1 by 3.236. 3.236 is equal to 2 times 1.618. You then add that value to the top or bottom of wave 1 for the maximum and minimum targets respectively. Nowadays, websites like TradingView do this for you automatically, so you don't really need to know the ins and outs of this. But seeing math applied to stocks is pretty interesting, so I thought I might as well include it. Now we got impulse waves out of the way, let's look at corrective waves. In a normal 535 zigzag correction, wave C is usually equal to the length of wave A. The length of wave C can also be found by multiplying 0.618 to the length of wave A and then subtracting the product from the bottom of wave A. For a flat 335 correction where wave B reaches or exceeds the top of wave A, wave C will be around 1.618 the length of wave A. A symmetrical triangle is very similar to this but each successive wave is related to the previous wave by about 0.618. Once again, websites do this for you automatically, so you just need to click the indicator search bar in whatever website or program you use. Now, let's go on to Fibonacci percentage retracements. Personally, I use this the most because Elliott waves are not always very definable as you have to look at different time lengths of charts as well as correctly identifying wave 1, so there's a lot of room to error. However, Fibonacci percentage retracements can be used without any setup as the computer does it all for you. I usually use it to give myself a general idea of support levels when corrections happen, but in short, this is how it works. You use 0, 0 0.5, and 1 as your main lines to predict retracements. 0 will represent the level of the all-time high, while 1 will be the all-time low of your range. From there, you just plus or minus 0 0.618 from 0 0.5. This gives you your retracement levels. Let's look at an example and see how the computer does all the work for us. Here we have Bitcoin and we saw a big correction. Here you see the program added 0.618 and subtracted 0.618 from 0.5 to give us these levels. 0.382 was especially useful as we saw the dip find support at this level. You can see, <coughs> you can see it active support again here. 
here you can see you can see here you can see again they act as here you can see again they act as support here. Currently Bitcoin is still consolidating in this region. However, these lines can also act as resistance as shown here. We had to test this level multiple times before breaking out to the upside until we're at the high of this time period, which is represented by the zero line. As you saw, Fibonacci ratios are very useful when trying to predict price. The three portions of the Elliott Wave Theory were patterns, ratios, and time. Since we did patterns in part 1 and just covered ratios, we will now go over time. Time is the least reliable of the three. Even avid fans of the Elliott Wave Theory do not use it often. However, it's a very versatile tool, so it can be applied to daily, weekly, and monthly charts. Basically, it predicts that something can happen on the 13th day, 13th week, or the 13th month. Likewise, the 21st day, 21st week, or 21st month, and so on. Well, that's it for this video. I hope everyone learned as much as I did reading a book, as that is the whole point of this channel. In this video, I wrapped up the Elliott Wave Theory. If you enjoyed this video and felt like you learned something new, like this video as it really supports the channel. If you have any questions, leave a comment below and I'll try my best to answer all the questions. Also, please subscribe to the channel as I have some interesting videos coming up in the future. Well, this is Books of the Stock Market, and I'll see you guys on Sunday.